Good morning and welcome to First Baptist on this rainy but warmer morning. Um, it's good to see all of you here in the, um, in the church building and hello to all of you on Zoom. For our announcements this morning, we have a pretty good list so we can go ahead and dive in. Monday, the Uplift Cancer Support Group will be meeting at 3 p.m. in the vestry. On Tuesday, the prayer group is meeting through Zoom at 7 p.m. to finish the discussion of the book we've been reading when God was your name, which is chapters 26, 27, and 28. And we'll be doing um, a new book going forward. So if you haven't been part of that and you'd like to dive in, you can see um, someone who's part of that group and we'd be happy to have you join. On Wednesday, the Mission and Outreach Committee meeting is at 7 p.m. and that's at the church. Thursday is the lasagna takeout dinner. And if you'd like to make a reservation, you can talk to Martha Thompson. Those are $12, and it's from 5 to 6.30 p.m. That, um, that Thursday, the Prudential Committee is meeting at 6 p.m. also, in person and on Zoom, and choir practices at the church at 7 p.m., so it's a busy day. Um, and then next Sunday, we'll be having our clocks turning forward for daylight savings, so um, make sure you do that to be on time. And the Mary Martha breakfast and meeting is at 8.30 a.m. And then after the service on Sunday, we'll be having um, a brief business meeting to talk about getting Jeremy on the Prudential Committee and any other business um, at that time. So that'll be right after the service, if you want to stay for that. And then Lindy Milet brought the flowers this morning in memory of her mother and father, Ruby and Wayne Norse. So thanks, Lindy. Those are beautiful. And we have a birthday coming up on Friday, Alan McGraw. Um, so happy birthday to Alan. Uh, for our word of preparation this morning, this is an excerpt from something that someone sent me that is a sort of a morning devotional email, and I thought it applied to our topics this morning, so I'll read it for you. The Christian faith is not an ethereal, fluffy philosophy. It is the concretized, mystical union between Jesus Christ and his people. The meaning of our chosenness is waking up to the face of his choosing us and responding by reorienting our lives, our entire lives, around seeking him and his kingdom. The big question we must reckon with is this one. Will we understand the church Jesus is building, a chosen people, as a centered set or a bounded set? In other words, will we focus our attention around the center or the circumference? There's a great deal of fear and anxiety around determining the circumference. We fear if we do not nail down the boundaries, we will lose the center altogether. The opposite is true. If we do not fix our gaze on the ever clear and clarifying center of Jesus and his kingdom, all boundaries will become confused, irrelevant, and ultimately distract people from the central pursuit. It is time for the chosen people to give everything they have to lifting up the one who chose them. Here's the secret. If you clarify the center, the center will gently and graciously form the circumference. The question that pleases Jesus is this one. How might everyone in my sphere of life and influence find and be found by Jesus? And of course, this has no hope of happening through my agency, lest Jesus become the defining center of my life.
call to worship this morning is from Romans 8, verses 12 to 23. And I'll be reading the unbolded text, and we'll read the bold text together. Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. For if you live by its dictates, you will die. But if through the power of the Spirit you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's Spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba, Father, for his Spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. And since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. But if we are to share his glory, we must also share his suffering. Yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. For all creation is waiting eagerly for that future day when God will reveal who his children really are. Against its will, all creation was subjected to God's curse. But with eager hope, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. For we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. And we believers also groan, even though we have the Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste of future glory. For we long for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering. We too wait with eager hope for the day when God will give us our full rights as his adopted children, including the new bodies he has promised us. I 
struggle's not the end game, the journey's where you are. You never want it perfect, you just want it my heart. And the story isn't over, if the story isn't good. Failure's never final when the father's in the room. No, failure's never final when the father's in the room. And ooh, lay your burdens down. Ooh, here in the Father's house, check your shame at the door, cause it ain't welcome anymore. And ooh, you're in the Father's house. find hope. Love is on the moon when the Father's in the room. Prison doors fling wide, the dead come to life. Love is on the moon when the Father's in the room. Miracles take place, the cynical find faith. Love is breaking through when the Father's in the room. Jericho walls are quaking, strongholds now are shaking. Love is breaking through when the Father's in the room. Yeah, love is breaking through when the Father's in the room. And do lay your burdens down. Ooh, here in the Father's house, check your shame at the door. It ain't welcome anymore Ooh, you're in the Father's house Amen. Great. I've really enjoyed reading the book um, that we chose for our last one for prayer group, When God Whispers Your Name. And this last part of the book with the, these several chapters are actually focused on eternity and the longing of our souls to be in our heavenly home with our Father, where he makes everything right. And one of the stories that Max Lucado shares in the book is about a newly married couple who went to a hotel that they had booked for their honeymoon. And it was really late, and they were very tired. So they were really looking forward to this beautiful room. But when they got there, they were disappointed. The room was small and unimpressive, it had no view, and a really cramped bathroom, and there wasn't even a bed. Just a pull-out couch with that bar that hits you in the wrong space. In the morning, the groom went down to the desk, and he complained about all those things that weren't right. And the cook listened patiently for a few minutes, and then he asked a question. Did you open the door in your room? And the groom said, well, no, I didn't. So he went back to the room. He opened the door that he thought was just a closet, and there was a spacious bedroom with a comfortable bed and a fruit basket and chocolates and a window with a breeze blowing in with a beautiful view. And Max is reading this story about the, you know, the article about the couple, and he's wondering, well, why did they just assume the door led nowhere? But then don't sometimes we do the same thing? He went on to compare that little anteroom that they had spent the night in with earth, and the room beyond it, the place that we long for, heaven. And it reminded me of the place in the Bible, John 10, where Jesus describes himself as the door. He wants us to take notice of him, to enter the Father's house through him, to find eternal life, which begins in our hearts now on earth and continues in heaven forever. And when we're adopted into God's family, we have access to that beautiful room every single day as we spend time with our Heavenly Father. 
We, do, we need to have intention and courage to enter the door because in my mind, it's kind of a cross-shaped door. To walk through it, we have to lay down our busyness, our own agenda, and be with God and learn his heart and align with God's will. So with this in mind, I invite you to listen to Kara as she reads Philippians 3, 17 to 21. Dear brothers and sisters, pattern your lives after mine and learn from those who would follow our example. For I have told you often before, and I say it again with tears in my eyes, that there are many whose conduct shows they are really enemies of the cross of Christ. They are headed for destruction. Their God is their appetite. They brag about shameful things, and they think only about this life here on earth. But we are citizens of heaven, where the Lord Jesus Christ lives, and we are eagerly waiting for him to return as our Savior. He will take our weak mortal bodies and change them into glorious bodies like his own, using the same power with which he will bring everything under his control. If you've read much in the New Testament, you probably already know this, but the Apostle Paul has many dimensions to his personality and personhood. He's a missionary, he's a scholar, a preacher, a writer, and he's also a mystic. He's encountered the risen Christ, which we highlighted in the sermon last week. And he's also experienced the glory of God in heaven through a vision and an experience he had. He writes about that in First and Second Corinthians. And having had this joy of regularly meeting with God, Paul wants all of his brothers and sisters in Christ to know God the same way that he does. And that's why I believe he starts this section um, with verse 17 saying, Dear brothers and sisters, pattern your lives after mine and learn from those who follow our example. Paul follows the example of Jesus, and he wants them to follow as well through the door. Once we have come to Christ and humbly laid down everything, including our sins, our efforts, our demands, our pride, we have that cross-shaped door of Christ inside of us. And body and soul, we become the temple of the Holy Spirit. Joyce Rupp wrote about this in something I read this week. She said, the body is often referred to as a temple of God, but our soul is also a wondrous residence. This hidden part of us, in union with divinity, is where our abundant goodness exists. Opening the door of our heart allows us entrance to the vast treasure of who we are and to the divine presence within us. Our authentic self, which is in union with God, may seem out of reach. It never is. When we open the door and go inside, God is there in the temple of our soul, which is not to dismiss the reality of the same loving presence being alive in our external world, the Holy One is with us in all of life. Our purpose for opening the door inward is to help us know and claim who we are so we can more completely join with God in expressing love in every part of our external world. Our time with God in silence, in nature, in prayer, in song, in word, in worship, it enables us to grow into our identity as a beloved child of God. We can let go of any of our small-mindedness, our self-centered behavior, and love God and our neighbors deeply with sincerity. Love is self-giving out of an abundance of God's love and blessing in our life. It's the very opposite of indulgence that our culture affirms as normal. Have you seen in that? different kinds of advertisements, go ahead and do it, you deserve it, you're worth it, indulge. But Paul describes the indulgent lifestyle with sadness in verses 18 and 19. For I have told you often before, and I say it again with tears in my eyes, that there are many whose conduct shows they are really enemies of the cross of Christ. They are headed for destruction. Their God is their appetite, and they brag about shameful things, and they think only about life here on earth. The people Paul is describing have never been through the cross-shaped door. They reject it, 
and they reject God's revelation of himself in Christ. They believe that life is about having fun or gaining as many things as possible here and now, satisfying every urge, even if it's unhealthy or dangerous, to themselves or other people. Have you met people who brag about the chances they've taken and lived through, the laws they have broken and seemingly gotten away with, the hearts that they have broken along the way? You know, it's not just other people's hearts that they break. It's God's heart, too. God wants so much more for them than what they're settling for. It's kind of like eating Cheetos and drinking Mountain Dew from a gas station vending machine when you could be at home around the table with people that you love eating a beautiful home-cooked meal. That kind of living might be like a guilty pleasure, but it is not deeply satisfying. Artificial things never are. They only really increase our cravings. Think for a moment about what guilty pleasures tempt you to indulge. Our desires for food and beauty and refreshment and love are natural, and they're given by God. And God wants us to experience pleasure, but not to have our whole life be centered around pleasure-seeking apart from the guidance and wisdom of the Holy Spirit. That's why we need to let go of our demands and our disordered attachments to everything else and hand them over to God and let God return them to us, our own desires, in a purified form, free of the bondage of addiction. Jesus died to set us free from the power of sin, which is essentially living for ourselves without love for God or concern for God's will. When we choose our own way, we see the cross in front of us and we hold up our hands to block it from having any effect on us. We don't even really want to see it. Have you done that in your life? Would you do it now just to see what that feels like? Block the cross so you can't even see it. Push your arms out in front of you. We resist the cross to try to create distance between us and God so we can have room to do our own thing. We might want God's blessings, but we don't want to surrender any of our earthly pleasures or the right to grab them whenever we want them. Even Christians can start to forget who they are and follow the example of people who think that this world is all that there is. But there is another way to live. And Paul names it in verse 20. We can remember that we're citizens of heaven, where the Lord Jesus Christ lives, and we are eagerly awaiting for him to return as our Savior. Some of the people in the church of Philippi would have known what it's like to be a citizen of a faraway city that they've never even seen. Since Philippi was a colony of Rome, its citizens held the rights and responsibilities of Roman citizens. If you were a man, you could vote, you could hold public office, own property, have your marriage recognized, have a legal trial, and even appeal a court's decision, and you're protected from being tortured. And women had a lot of these rights, but they did not have the right to vote or hold office back then. Paul himself was a Roman citizen, which is why when he was whipped and thrown in prison in Philippi without a trial, the people who, who later learned he was a Roman citizen were like trembling, uh-oh, we messed up, we're going to be in big trouble. Yet some of the believers in the church of Philippi were probably slaves that had no rights. They could only dream of having all those privileges of citizenship. And the rights of Roman citizens were something that we're used to. We might even take them for granted as citizens of the United States. But as we catch glimpses of life in other places on our planet, we realize they're not just a given for everyone, are they? The responsibilities that went with Roman citizenship included supporting the Roman Empire financially with taxes and making decisions that would be good for all people in the empire. 
You're supposed to think beyond yourself. And Paul is assuring the believers in Philippi that they are all full citizens of heaven, and they have the rights and responsibilities of belonging to God's kingdom. Unlike Roman citizenship, which in involved different levels of and privileges and rights, citizenship in God's kingdom is free of hierarchy. In another one of Paul's letters, he spells it out this way. This is Galatians 2, 26 to 28. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. And this applies to all of us here too, because it's true for all time. It doesn't matter where we live, who our parents are, what our background is, what gender we are, how old or young we are, or what we do for a living. The only thing that matters is in Christ Jesus, we're children of God through faith. The ground at the foot of the cross is level. There are plenty of seats at the table in heaven for every person. So. What are the rights of being a citizen of heaven? We get access to the throne of God through Christ. We have with us always an advocate to help and empower us and guide us through life. And when we face God's judgment, as every person will, we have Christ's righteousness covering our sin and making us holy so that we can stand. We have the freedom to worship, to make choices, to live without bondage and without fear. And we know where we'll go when this earthly life is over. We can enjoy the peace and comfort that that promise of resurrection brings us. So what are the responsibilities of heavenly citizenship? God wants us to stay in contact with our king and align our lives with his plans to love God and love our neighbors, both in our words and our attitudes and deeds, and to invite others to find this freedom in Christ. He wants us to be part of a colony of heaven, like our little church here, a community where we serve and encourage each other, and to look and pray for Christ's return. When we hold our citizenship in heaven as our highest identity, our priorities and our motivations will be different from the culture all around us. Steve Machia talked about this need for focus in our week's teaching on the discerning life retreat that I'm participating in over these 10 weeks. He said, we have to shift away from the way the world is pushing us and encouraging us to be, and instead to live faithfully and fruitfully for the glory of God and to do so together with grace and power and love for one another. We let go of the reins of a self-empowered life and let God carry us forward into a God-empowered life. We learn to live more open-handedly, to discover the joy of dying to self in order for another to flourish. You will know you are living the abundant life when you consistently say yes, to God's invitation to love, to trust, to follow, to obey, to serve, to know, and to give. Make daily choices to open your ears, your hands, your heart, to receive the gifts God delights to freely offer, and then choose to give yourself away in abundance. When we live with our daily lives, with outstretched arms of love, our inner and exterior world, they're both abundant. There's nothing scarce about it. He writes this, and I invite you to, to actually do it. Posture yourself this way. Yes, physically stand up and stretch out your arms as wide as possible. Come on. <laughs> That is the radiance of abundance. And what shape are you in? Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. That's, he said, live this way and you'll never be the same again. And this is the big thing that God taught me this week. The cruciform way, following Christ, is the way of abundance. Matt and I have been trying to learn this lesson for some time. And there is a joy in letting God's provision and blessing flow through our lives to other people. But the truth of it has gone deeper into my heart. It's all for God's goodness. His peace, his forgiveness, his love, his presence, acceptance, joy, and material things. All of those things that we find in that Father's house room. All of them come from our, my, our connection with him. And we can give all of those things to other people without worrying about becoming depleted. Because we can always go back and get more. Romans 8.32 says, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Enough for us, enough to share with others, enough to accomplish anything that God wants us to do with our life. So many people are focused just on their bodies. And our bodies are amazing gifts from God, but they actually belong to him. They're only entrusted to us, stewarded to us. And we need to find the balance of how to take care of them without being inordinately attached to pampering and preserving them. The last verse in our text from Philippians for this morning gives us this promise and glimpse into the future for our bodies. He, Christ, will take our weak, mortal bodies and change them into glorious bodies like his own, using the same power with which he will bring everything under his control. Jesus let go of his earthly body in his early 30s because his purpose for that body was fulfilled. He trusted in God's resurrection power to overcome death, and he rose from the grave. In the New Interpreter's Bible Commentary, um, I read, Christ was born in human likeness and shared human death in order that Christians might be transformed into his likeness and share his vindication, his victory over death. We willingly share in his death and then experience his resurrection and become like him. It's the same thing that Paul wrote in Romans 6, 5. If we have been united with him in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. His resurrection body was able to talk and walk and go through locked doors and, and walls. It was able to break bread and eat with his friends and also to ascend up into heaven. I'm looking forward to a body like that. The broken body that was so cruelly treated and hung on the cross, was restored and glorified. Jesus, for our sake, still bears the scars of his crucifixion for our redemption. But in every other way, his body is whole. And that's what we have to look forward to, both his return to set all things right with the world, and we need it, and our spiritual resurrected body that will be free from all the death-dealing effects of sin. Until the day of his appearing, we get to choose. Will we ignore and try to block him from our lives? Or will we seek the door, enter our heavenly country, our true home with Christ? Will we settle for a Cheetos and Mountain Dew curled up on the pull-out couch kind of life? Or will we live with hands that are stretched wide open to receive his abundance and to share his grace with everyone. Please consider your answer as we sing our song to prepare us for communion.
that you are all welcome to the Lord's table to honor and remember our Savior, Jesus Christ, and to receive his grace anew. Would you bow with me? Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who invites us into your presence now and for eternity. We see the beauty and brokenness of this world, and we long for the next age to begin, where all is made new. Thank you for sending us a savior to show us the way, to teach us to live with outstretched arms. Please give us the grace to receive your salvation as we remember what it cost. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm reading from 1 Corinthians 11, verses 23 to 26. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had broken it, he ble and blessed it, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do it as often as you do in remembrance of me. Take and eat, remembering Christ's body broken for you. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim my death until I come. Take and drink, remembering Christ's blood shed for you. Would you bow one more time with me? Thank you, Lord Jesus, for giving us all you have and all you are. Please give us courage to come to the door and enter into eternal life, to find our life by losing it. We look for the day when you return, and may it fill our hearts with hope for us and for our world. Thank you for your promise and for your faithfulness to keep it. Even so come, Lord Jesus. Amen.
benediction from Hebrews 13, 14, and 15. May we always remember this world is not our home. We are looking forward to the everlasting home in heaven. With Jesus' help, we will continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God by telling others of the glory of his name. Amen. <laughs>